What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what's up? It's Jay Campbell and I'm making a quick commercial here for seercustom.com, my revolutionary cosmeceutical peptides company, co-founded with my business partner, Nick Andrews, who happens to be one of the world's top formulators. We have the revolutionary Oxano Grow, which completely regrew my hair. If you guys saw my hair about a year ago, I was almost bald. I even had the micropigmentation program from uh, Advantis. And now I've completely regrown my hair. That's just with version one. Version two is now in the marketplace or will be very, very soon. And it is three to five times as more effective than the current version or the original beta version of Oxano. We also have Royal Blue Serum and Sky Blue Cream, which will completely upgrade your face. I mean, I'm almost 50 years old. I have a pretty good complexion. I use it regularly. My wife swears by it. It will reduce fine lines and wrinkles, dramatically improve elasticity, and just the overall look and feel of your face. You feel great on both of them. You can also use them with red light therapy. There's all sorts of great stuff. So go to a seercustom.com. And if you're a first time customer, use the coupon J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I appreciate all you guys. And I send you tremendous love and light. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell, of course, the founder of the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual Zoom studio with a really cool dude who actually represents a little bit of a twist from what I normally uh, interview. And that would be Derek Wynn. Derek, how are you, brother? I'm good, Jay. Thanks so much for having me on. It's awesome to have you. I like your little uh, violet, ultraviolet, like pink light in the background. I feel like I'm in the club, bro. That is dope. Yeah, I mean, anyway. you got to do something to spruce it up. I'm in insurance, so, <laughs> so we got awesome. to look cool somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're fitting the bill. So let me give you guys Derek's bio real quick, actually. He is a corporate healthcare strategist and the president and co-founder of Distilled Concepts. And the reason I have Derek on the show here today, he's got a little illustrious pedigree, is to talk about the healthcare situation as it is now in the United States. And He's an expert and we're going to go probably pretty deep on stuff. And obviously I'm kind of outspoken about this because of the things that I've experienced uh, in the last 10 years of my life being formerly in the corporate world and now just being like an entrepreneur. Um, so I, you know, I can compare and contrast both sides of the equation, but uh, you know, Derek, as I always do on the Jay Campbell podcast, how did you get on the Jay Campbell podcast? You know, I, it's one of those things where you kind of get into life and you get a little bit busy and, you know, I hired a great uh, PR firm and they said, Hey, you know, we know this guy, Jay, and he's got a great show. And, you know, I tuned in and said, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to be on that show because I think you've got a great message and you're doing great things. And, you know, I think it's a great example of how the crossroads of, you know, traditional and, and one could even say like even super traditional worlds could kind of intersect. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, just because you and I haven't spoken, um, you know, one of my biggest mantras at one time was talking about the sick care system, right, which is, you know, managed care, whatever you want to call it, where people go who are ill and they have a 40 hour copayment and my doctor says that I can do this versus like, you know, what I'm all about, which is the optimized healthcare system, whereas people take ownership for their own health. And they don't care if their quote unquote, you know, normal medical benefits don't pay for it. They'll pay out of pocket to have functional medicine or optimized wellness or whatever you want to call it. So that's kind of like, you know, just to set that dividing line for this amazing podcast. But um, so let's just jump in. Right. So the current state of healthcare in America, define it for me. Uh, it's too expensive. It uh, is broken and fractured. It is one of those things where people are waiting for a good news day and they often aren't getting it, you know, and, and good news to many people is, Hey, guess what? Healthcare costs less. And most people aren't getting that message, you know? So I'll, I'll kind of back up to one thing and, and this is a good thing to think about. And you, you just nailed it in terms of the sick care system. You know, people get excited when you look at the stock market and you see stocks like zoom and Netflix and Amazon, which are all subscription based services. But I'll tell you, they, they pale in comparison to the subscription-based healthcare system. Right. 
you know, when your doctor puts you on a medication, they put you on a subscription. Right. When your doctor wants to see you for treatments, that's a subscription, yeah. right? So when you really boil it down, you know, we've got a, a broken healthcare system and, and, you know, a lot of us, even in our industry, we'll call it a sick care system because that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. I mean, let's, yeah, I mean, there's no illusion, right? Like if you, well, you know, I, I have the saying, most people don't give a shit about their health until they don't have their health, right? Like they're not proactive. They're not exercising, eating clean, you know, doing the things that I talk about all the time. I mean, it's just kind of like, it's reactionary. It's like, oh my God, I was diagnosed with this or my hair started falling out or, you know, this happened and I went to the doctor and now, oh my God, I'm in this. And now I have to like embrace healthcare and I have to embrace living a cleaner lifestyle and stuff. So it's, it's funny um, where people are. And obviously, as I always say, you have to be proactive, but why is healthcare and obviously it's opinion question um, and partially not opinion, but why is it so expensive in the United States? Uh, one of the main reasons why it's so expensive is because we've all contributed to allowing it to be so expensive. So let me, let me kind of break this down a little bit. Today's healthcare system rewards providers for treatment. Right. In other words, the more treatments you provide, the greater the reward, the greater the paycheck. That's called fee for service. Right. The more services you perform, the more fees you collect. Health insurance companies also work the same way. So think about this. Health insurance companies have to basically, if you're a fully insured health plan, so if you're buying it through a major insurer, right, they have what they call minimum loss ratios for any kind of fully insured plan. And what it is, is 85 cents on the dollar for large employers has to go toward claims. Right. And 15 cents on the dollar can be kept. Well, think about that for a second. The only way I can increase my overall profit because I'm on a fixed budget is to charge more in claims, which sure. means I have to pay more claims which right. means I'm rewarding that behavior. So right. that's the first thing I would say is, is kind of a, it's, a, it's the, the, the tail that wags the dog kind of thing, right? The second thing is, is that again, Americans have allowed it to happen. Americans have consistently voted with their feet to go to high quality, or excuse me, high cost, low quality providers. Right. So the more you go to that hospital for routine services like an MRI, and when you're paying five to tens more times the same price you'd pay for an MRI at a freestanding facility, you're rewarding them for charging more, right? right? So I think, I think the key to solving that really kind of comes back to Americans taking control. The other reason why healthcare is so expensive, you know, I'll give you a statistic on this, right? Think about this for a second. If, if you want to know what the average healthcare expense is for an individual in America, the average is over $11,000 a year which sounds crazy, like $11,000 a year. I mean, that's 110 doctor visits, right. you know, maybe one baby born, right? right? But think about this, the median healthcare expense is $660. Wow. So in other words, the healthiest 50% of America spends less than $660 a year. But when you have super utilizers, people who are gravely ill and sick, and we hope they're okay, and we hope they're getting the care they need, they also, at the same time, again, are ones that are driving healthcare costs. So the question is, how can we get ahead of that? You know, how can we fix that? How can we get them in front of higher quality doctors? How can we get them in front of lower cost providers? What's interesting is, and not many people will believe this, when you look at cost and quality, high quality providers cost less. Would you trust the mechanic who does 50 oil changes uh, you know, a day to, to change the oil in your car, right? And do it right and not have it blow out on the road going on on your way down the road or would you trust the guy that does it maybe once once a month right right because at the end of the day it can cost less even if it costs more front it's going to cost less long term if we don't have reinfections redos revisions etc on a surgery there's so many things that go into this but that's just the the key takeaway to keep in mind yeah, it's mind blowing when you think of that data of five hundred fifty one dollars. Because I mean, again, and you, you know, you and I are old enough to remember before this prostitution of healthcare, where you know they raised the deductible to wherever the number was. I mean, I I don't even remember. It's like I blocked it all out of my mind. It was just so sickening. But like you know, you used to be able to go to a doctor 
with a decent healthcare plan. And by the way, everyone had a decent healthcare plan 20 years ago. It mm-hmm. wasn't like insane. It was just, as you said, we all agreed to it and we collectively created that energy stream of like, this is affordable. And then, you know, I won't mention names, but, you know, different presidency and we changed it and they created the Affordable Care Act and it just became this gigantic insurance subrogation scam. And they raised the deductible to where it was. And, you know, when you start doing the math, Eric, like you just said $551, the average person and the deductible is like on a good healthcare plan of a PPO is what, six to $8,000 a year. Yeah, it depends on where you are. So again, like, you know, it's hard to deal in averages, but let me just give you an example on this. So, so typically and traditionally, when you look at health insurance plans, right, there's group market and there's sure. individual market. So in the group market, you're buying through an employer. Employers traditionally have only known to control cost by taking the balloon and squeezing the air from one end to the other. In other words, we're going to control the cost of premium, but inflate the out-of-pocket cost. And that's how deductibles have gone from, let's say, $300 to over $1,300 on average day in just the last 10 years. But here's the kicker, right? In that same time frame, I'll give you another example. Knee replacement surgery has gone from $24,000 to $34,000 in that same time frame. So think about it. We're increasing deductibles, again, pushing the balloon from one end to the other, but at the same time, the cost of those services are just getting bigger. And in fact, they're they're getting bigger at a faster rate that it's like, well, wait a second, my deductible went up last year, but how is my insurance premium still going up? And it's because it's not outpacing medical inflation and what hospitals and doctors and pharmaceutical companies are getting for their prices. And it's not just what they're charging, but it's what insurance companies are allowing to pay for. That's nuts. You said 1300. I've never seen that's like, I know that's nationwide, but that's nothing close to what California is. I mean, yeah, and that's, yeah, and that's a national uh, group average. So on the individual market, you know, keep in mind, you know, with the individual market, one of the biggest issues that the individual market has faced is that the individual markets never grew at the pace that they were anticipated to grow. And in fact, what's happened in the process is, you know, an individual health plan is usually going to cost, you know, depends on the market, but let's just say 15 to 20 percent more than the same type of a group plan yeah. you know and again that's insurance companies looking at it and saying we don't know any other way to control cost because we've got to keep our providers happy the only way to keep them happy is to continue to pay them escalations and higher costs for those services so we're just going to continue to defer this over to the member so you know again it's it's a vicious cycle i mean horrible horribly i mean i when i hear that number though i just think like that just shows you how big of a scam it is to live in california because it's like four times that i've I've never seen anything under four thousand dollars with a family of five yeah state to state state to state it varies widely and even in markets from market to market like county to county it can change too um you know when when you really think about and you start to get down into the bolt nuts and bolts of again the healthcare options and everything else the key thing to keep in mind is again what are you doing to control that cost right Right. because if you're on the hook up to you know six thousand dollars yeah you're going to be looking at that that's where this the the healthcare industry has failed consumers you know the healthcare industry started calling these consumer driven health plans without giving them the data they need to be an actual effective consumer of healthcare we don't know the cost of the service before we get the bill right? You know, we get a bill in the mail and it's like, hey, you owe X dollars. Well, no one ever told me that it would cost that much. Well, part is you never asked. The second part is, is they probably said, ask your insurance company. You know, and that's, that's like the, the really hard part about this, you know, is that right now there's just not a lot of transparency for people to be good consumers, but the answers are out there if, if you look for them. It's funny you said that because, you know, again, as I told you off air and a lot of my list, audience, listeners know that I use uh, Liberty HealthShare, right? So uh, my family is enrolled with the HealthShare. It saved me literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last eight years of my life. And, you know, knock on wood, we haven't had any, you know, fatal issues or, or calamities. But I mean, every time that there has been things and there's been broken bones and, you know, illnesses and stuff like they've been awesome, you know, and I've paid Four ninety nine, and now they've just you know jacked us to like six seventy nine or something like that a month. But bro, this is ninety eight percent. And again, I don't want to get into like the debate of health share versus benefits, but they pay reimburse ninety eight percent of expenses. And again, the deductible isn't a deductible because it's a health share, right? So the reality is, um, what before I moved to this, and I was with Aetna, like the top level Aetna PPO provider in California. I think it was like Blue Cross Blue Shield, whatever the fuck it was. They wanted like $1,700 a month back in, I think it was 2012 when I shifted or 2013. I don't remember what it was, but it was insane. And that was with a $6,500 deductible. And I looked at my wife and I'm like, this is criminal. Like 
we don't, you know, we, we, obviously my family, again, knock on wood is healthy. And, you know, I have younger, I had younger kids at that time and we were like at the lower end of the risk pool, but it's like, this is insane, dude. Like I'm paying all this money every month for nothing. And then even if something happens, I still got to pay another six grand just to even get any re restitution. Yeah. Let's, let's think about this. So there was, there was actually, there's a number of different ways we can go on this, but one of the things to keep in mind, look at the statistics around the affordability of just, I'll just call it life right now. Right. Um, you know, one of the things I would go back to is there was an article in the Atlantic earlier this year called the great affordability crisis. And what they did is they took a look at childcare, healthcare, housing, and education. And they said, look at the cost increases in these four sectors. As far as what workers are concerned about, it's crazy. Like, did you know that here in the state of Virginia, for example, it costs as much to send a newborn to daycare as it does for a year of tuition at a public school. Insane, right. I mean, like, think about this. I mean, Americans are getting hit from every direction when it comes to cost. And again, those are just four bread and butter items. Well, think about this for a second. When you look at the number of people who run out of money before the next paycheck arrives, 32% of Americans, whether they make $40,000 a year or $200,000 a year in this study, were all shown to run out of money before the next paycheck came. That's insane, dude. So how can you expect people to pay toward a $6,000 deductible? much less a, you know, in, in, in this case, a $1,300 deductible, if you look at it, it's just, it's, 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 it's really catastrophe for many Americans because they just can't afford it because yeah. they're getting hit in all these other areas too. And that's where it comes back to like, here are the four big things to think about. And healthcare just continues to be one, you know, we were supposed to have more affordable healthcare and here we are, costs are just continuing to go up. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jay Campbell. Quick commercial for the optimized tribe with us navy seal michael jaco and i every monday night at 6 p.m pacific standard time there is not a single group online where you will get the highest level intel that michael and i can provide you from mastering intuition to fully optimizing your hormonal health to improving your fitness to raising your vibration and increasing your consciousness there isn't a single group online with two dudes like michael and myself helping people become the best version of their self. It's literally $99 a month and you get a 90 minute call with me and Michael every single Monday night. Don't wait another second. Sign up now at the link, theoptimizedtribe.com. I appreciate you guys and I send you tremendous love and light. Bro, we can't even elect a president in this country. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's where we are right now. I mean, without getting into politics, but so the solutions, dude. So Derek, what are the solutions that politicians are really probably just afraid to consider? Well, the, the first thing is when it really comes down to, you know, this is, I, I always get heat for this, but, you know, take a look at where the money goes. You have to follow the money. You know, so first of all, go back and take a look at just in this election, take a look at the amount of money the big health care spent backing either candidate. So big healthcare, I mean, managed care plans, so insurance companies, I mean, hospital chains, and I mean, pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Um, you know, Biden caught nearly uh, $2 to every $1 that Trump took in, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, why is that? Well, there's a few different reasons why. And this is, again, not a political statement. These are facts. Yeah, of course. When you take a look at what happened with Obamacare 1.0, you know, the best way to understand who that was good for was to take a look at stock prices right. from 2008 to current for everyone from health insurers to pharmaceutical companies, so on and so forth. When you're creating parameters where you legislate profits for insurance companies, right. which is basically what the law did, and tell them that they're covering all of these different things. And oh, by the way, when you cover these things, you get to increase your premium. Yeah. That's how they made more money. Um, you know, right now we're kind of setting up for what I'll, what I'll call, you know, Obamacare, maybe 1.1 or maybe 2.0. We'll wait and see. Um, with, with what politicians are doing, you know, anything that politicians generally do when it comes to regulating healthcare and cause more regulation, and it's generally not going to be good for the general public when it comes to just pure cost, right? So let me back up and think about this for a second, right? There are many, many good things that came out of the Affordable Care Act. I'm not disputing that. I think that you know, things like pre-existing conditions and, and lifting lifetime limits and creating essential health benefits and allowing your dependents to stay on your plan until the end of the month of their 26th birthday and all these other things, those are all great things. Like I'm not going to dispute that. 
But the problem is, is that it didn't actually regulate the cost of health care. Remember that right. knee replacement we talked well, about? Remember that prescription you just paid for? It didn't actually address the affordability of those. All it did was tell insurance companies, here's what you have to pay for. So when we look at what it might look like going forward, you know, like you said, we haven't even, you know, we can't even elect the president. I think we've elected him, but who knows what's going to happen, right? When you look at kind of what the plan is, one of the big things they, they are touting is, okay, let's come up with a public option. Let's have kind of like one big public option that everybody can enroll in. Well, that's good to boost enrollment numbers, but how are you actually reducing the cost of care? Right. right? It's still going to be managed by an insurance company. They're still going to use networks to negotiate the cost. It's not actually going to be likely a more cost-effective option. Okay, fast forward. What's next? Well, we want to lower the Medicare age to, let's say, age 60. I think that's a good move. I think that's a good move for two reasons. One, you've got a lot of people who can't afford to retire because they rely on their employer-sponsored health plan. Right. You know, you could be 60 years old and, and be set theoretically in terms of your retirement savings, but you're staring down the barrel of $1,200, $1,500, $2,000 a month for health insurance coverage. Like Thank people you. can't do that. Literally insane. Yeah. So, so that's a good option because it allows for that. But get this, here's the other thing. Jay, you know this, I know this. As we get older, our bodies are going to need more TLC. Yeah, exactly. Like that's aging, right? But here's the kicker. When you have people who are 60 to 65 who want to retire but can't, they drive up the claims for everyone else. Exactly. So that's also going to be potentially a good thing for people who are still on those employer plans. So I'm, I'm for that. Uh, you know, other things they're talking about doing, again, common sense items. Somehow, magically, you know, all of America is now all for healthcare cost transparency. You know, well, it's been a problem for more than the last 10 years, right. but, but now it's a problem that we want to solve because it's a political talking point. The problem is, is that all of those people who fund the campaigns for politicians and lobbying efforts and everything else, they don't want to have their prices out in the open, right? right? They don't want to do that because right. that's, right. yeah, they operate in the dark, right? They need some sunshine disinfectant. Uh, <laughs> we can clean things up that way, but they like to operate in the dark. So let's see what happens there. And there's so many different things, even like reimportation of medications. Why is it that a pharmaceutical medication can come from a pharmacy in Vancouver for half the price that I can get it here in Fairfax, Virginia? Or Mexico, you can buy it for one fourth the cost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, so this is kind of where we go and, and we talk about like, what can we do? Well, number one, like the point of that is we can't rely on politicians to save us. We can't rely on insurance companies to save us. Really, Americans have to take a lot of this on their own. Um, they have to have conversations with their employers and remind their employers that there's options out there. Because, you know, roughly more than half of America is enrolled in, in, in let's say, employer-sponsored health care. So employers are the largest stakeholder in healthcare today. You know, employers rewarded employees to bring them into their workplace years ago following World War II, and now they're being told you have to provide health insurance coverage and, and it's gotta be affordable. The biggest thing is employers have to understand that there's solutions out there. Things like buying prescriptions from Vancouver and Mexico, I've been doing that for years. Yeah, that's why I go to Mexico two to three times a year, bro. You know, full, full disclosure. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's super easy, right? I mean, if you build a plan, you work with the right partners, and you bring it in, then you can do that. I mean, Amazon came out. A lot of people were counting on Amazon to really shake things up. Amazon just announced yesterday they've got their pharmacy program live. So, you know, that's out there, and you can buy your prescriptions on Amazon now with a prescription. I wonder if but they'll be cheaper than Costco, by the way, because I haven't found not that really. cheaper than Costco. Yeah. Yeah, so the data we have right now is showing that largely the costs are about the same. Now, will it help to promote medication adherence? I hope so. You know, yeah. a lot of people are prescribed medications, whether or not they need them is a different story. <laughs> Most people are prescribed medications. And, um, That's all you know, podcast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's only like a 22, like 22 percent of people who are prescribed a medication don't take it, yeah. right? They don't adhere to the protocol. So at that point, it becomes like a, like a sugar tablet, you know, yeah. like if you're not taking it every day or the way you're supposed to, it just depends. Well, before somebody says, well, what do you take a J? Everybody, I know this is what I take. I take therapeutic testosterone. I take metformin and I take desiccated thyroid. The J Campbell's stack and you can Google it and find out about it. But, uh, but yeah, no, totally dude. And like, you know, again, they've preyed upon the geriatric populations, right? Cause most of those guys are taking literally 25 different medications, you know, one medication that covers the side effects of the other medication. I mean, that's just, dude, we don't even want to go down that rabbit hole. Well, so 
what I'll give you, you, I'll go, I'll give you a quick one to think about in that Jay. So sure. like, let me, let me give you an example of what people should be doing. You know, what, what is it? I know the statistic it's out there. It's like 42% of those who are over age 65 are on, you know, like four more prescriptions. Nuts. Well, think about that. If you're on four more prescriptions, you might be seeing four more doctors. Are those doctors communicating with each other? That comes back to, you have to be the captain of your health. Yes. You have to be your own CEO of your health. Yes. What you have to do is you have to take control. And part of taking control may be, hey, I need a support captain. I need a co-pilot for my healthcare. And that should be one doctor who can integrate all of your care, right? Like that's really what it comes back to. Don't be going to four doctors for four different conditions, taking four different medications without sharing that. You have to be in control. The problem is though, Derek, is that the elder, you know, let's just define them as the boomer generation right now. They literally listen to the advice of their doctor like it's God. Yep. You know, the lab coat God complex where my doctor said, you know, I mean, I've had so many conversations, right? Because I know all the best doctors. I work with them, right? And I tell my parents, I'm like, look, dude, I don't care what so-and-so told you. That's not the latest and greatest advice. And again, a lot of these people are working with doctors who are also in their 60s and 70s, right? Well, and have let, let the system, you know, kind of educate them and they're not progressive. They're not up to date with like the newest and best and greatest. And so it's like, dude, but you said it right. It's, you know, one of my doctor friends, Jim Meehan, he always says you have to become the proactive scientist of your own health. If you are not that person, then you are going to be taken advantage of and you are going to be using multiple medications, some of which cause issues with the other medications. I mean, it's insanity where healthcare has gotten to, but like you said, it's a very predatory system and they're all trying to make money. And that's why I always say like, you know, I don't hate the doctors. The doctors are just part of this system that they've come up in, which is, as you said, to bill subscriptions. Well, let me, let me use an example. And this is, you know, it's 2020, so I can say this, right? Um, <laughs> it's a Jay Campbell podcast. You can say whatever you want. Let me, let, me give you a, let me give you a statement to see if your listeners agree. All police officers are good. All politicians are good. You know, think about that. How many people just got the hair on their neck that stood up? Think about your doctor cross-section. You know what you call someone who got a D in medical school? Right. Doctor. Right. Right. So what you have to do is you have to look at things objectively. We can't simply sit here and say all police officers are good. All politicians are good. All doctors are good. Right. Because there are good ones. There are great ones and there's okay ones. I'm not going to say there's bad doctors out there, but you can go listen to other podcasts like Dr. Death and find out there are. Right. So, you know, like this is what you have to think about. The other thing to think about too is, you know, when you're taking those medications, think about how those drugs can interact. You know, you've got, you've got a number of different interactions there. And this is the last thing I'll say on that topic too, on the prescription side. You know, you think about, you got drug-drug interactions. If those drugs don't mix well, you know, that could be bad for you. We think about where we've come in healthcare today. You've also got drug gene, you know, so there's great things out there like PGX testing. You know, so like if you're even like, you know, biohacking light, right. you know, you probably want to go get a PGX test done, pharmacogenomics testing, and yep. just see kind of what that looks like for you and your genome type, whether yeah. or not your body's even metabolizing that drug. That's absolutely true. I mean, I work with a ton of those companies, True Diagnostics, Self Hacked, all of them. I mean, it's very important to have data. You know, I always try to stress with people, though, that obviously the genetic code is ultimately determined by your epigenetics, so it's your lifestyle more than your, your, your hereditary. But there's no question that that kind of information is available to us now and at the tips of our fingers. Again, if we're proactive and if we become, you know, students of our own health and, 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 and you know, you, you've said it best. Is there anything else you wanted to say um, before we go? Yeah, you know, I think, I think the other thing I just add in here is, you know, you got to think about medicine and just medicine in general. You know, we've talked a lot about prescriptions. We've talked about healthcare. And, you know, there's, there's other great medicines out there too. You know, sunlight, walking, <laughs> food, right. Meditation. right? Yeah, meditation, mindfulness. I mean, these are all things that people have to think about because, again, we're taking medications, prescriptions, getting treatments for things that we can treat through other solutions. You know, you're feeling stressed out, go do some exercise, go run as fast as you can for 20 minutes and see how you feel after that. Right. right? You know, these are things people have to think about. And even when it comes down to other, other forms of medicine out there, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm honestly really excited for, I think, what the next 10 years are going to bring in the new decade, because I think a lot of this is going to be a throwback. It you will know, be. Um, 
You know, we just saw recently, like, uh, you know, you're seeing all these news reports come out about, you know, states like Oregon uh, legalizing, you know, even what I'll just call hard drugs for a second. But at the same time, I think that, you know, I, I listened to this recently on a, on a show too. They talked about uh, magic mushrooms and there's evidence out now about how that's going to be really great for people with PTSD, yeah, uh, major depressive disorders, et cetera. Um, you know, I think, I think there's going to be a, a change in terms of how we approach healthcare. You know, as always, find a good doctor, take your doctor's orders. Um, but again, you have to be in control of that. But I think taking a look at non-traditional medicine, even something like acupuncture, is a lot better than getting a surgery, especially on your back. Well, Derek, I'll be honest. And again, I work with all the best doctors in the world and they know this. I mean, I won't go to see a doctor unless I'm bleeding out, shot yeah. by a machine gun or a shotgun or, you know, whatever, you know, in a car accident, have shrapnel or projectiles stuck in me. I'm not going to a doctor, right? And there's some of the best doctors in the whole world will tell you, you know, that essay, which anybody can Google and fact check me where Google, where doctors go to die. You know, they tell you that do not be stuck dead over the age of 65 in a hospital because it's the last place you want to be because it's the highest statistical percentage that that's where you'll end up dead yep. due to doctor negligence malpractice whatever you want to call it but yeah man like everything you said i mean you can absolutely become your own doctor become the scientist of your own health educate yourself use the internet you know look into life extension supplements look into life extension biohacking practices which you just mentioned there's so many of them go outside of nature ground become contemplative or mindful or meditative or introspective or any of these things before you run to, you know, the clinic for a sniffle diagnosis, you know, and then there's the, you know, people out there whose kids, you know, start getting a sniffle or, yeah. you know, they say their ear aches and they just run to the doctor when they don't need that. I mean, basically the doctors are going to give them the same therapy that you could do it as a parent. Um, yeah. I think, I think the other takeaway too, in, in doctor's advice, you know, um, I have to say I'm not a doctor, although I did play one on TV, but you have to keep in mind doctors, when they get treatment, they get less treatment. You know why? Because they ask questions. You as a patient have rights. You should ask questions. You should get second opinions. Anytime someone tells you, Hey, this is what's for you. Uh, there's so much you can be doing as a patient. You just have to take control. Totally brother. I mean, it's funny you say that we can end the show and then I'll let you share how people can work with you and get on your podcast and stuff. But, uh, my doctors, the doctors that I work with and stuff like that, like that's their greatest claim is they'll say, I love the people that you send me, dude, because they're all educated. They make my job so much easier. They've done the work. They've done their research. You know, they sometimes will know more about some of the things that I'm prescribing than I do. Right. So it's like, there's no reason to think that you can't educate yourself and take that information and that awareness to your physician because your physician like you said, I mean, a lot of these guys are seeing so many different people, like they're much more profoundly interested in a person that's actually interested in their own health than somebody who's just waiting for them to give them some garden variety answer when we're all biochemically unique. Yep. Ask a doctor, what would you do? If one of the real answer, I mean, that's, that's when they tell you, Hey, I would do this. Now you feel better about it. Get a second opinion still, but that's just the way to think about it. Derek Winman, amazing, phenomenal. I really appreciate you coming on the show. If somebody wants to get more about you, work with you, even possibly come on your podcast or whatever, how's, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah, so on social, I'm most active on LinkedIn. Um, but you can also reach us at distilled-concepts.com. Um, so feel free to reach out. I'm also Link, on Twitter. LinkedIn.com, um, Derek Wynn, and it's spelled W-I-N-N, right? D-E-R-E-A, yep. correct? Yes, sir. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, you guys that you're watching, obviously, please support the amazing beings that come on the Jay Campbell podcast and support them by going to their websites or following them on social media. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys very soon.